Good afternoon and welcome to this group of candidate forums put on by the League of Women Voters of Elmhurst. I am Jan Dorner and Dorothy McGuire and I are co-presidents of the Elmhurst League. The League of Women Voters is an issue-oriented, volunteer, member-directed organization that neither supports nor opposes any candidates or parties. We do act on issues after member study and consensus. We are committed to open, responsive, and effective government brought about by informed, involved people with membership open to both men and women 16 years and older. This year, the League commemorates its 100th anniversary, and the Elmhurst League joins over 700 local leagues to celebrate this historic milestone. The League's historic commitment to register, educate, and mobilize voters is not only stronger, but more effective than ever. <clears throat> Utilizing such tools as IllinoisVoterGuide.org, a cutting-edge election information website utilized by Illinois voters every election cycle. This site will go live the first day of early voting, which is February 6th. Thank you again for attending or watching these forums to become an educated voter. Thank you, and welcome to our forum. My name is Gilda Carew. I'm with the League of Women Voters of the Arlington Heights, Mount Prospect, Buffalo Grove area, and I do not live in this district, so that I will be perfectly neutral here in terms of I, I do not um, vote in this district. Uh, the rules for today's forum are as follows. Uh, each candidate will have one minute for an opening statement. Each candidate will have one minute to answer question, each question. And then each candidate will be given one minute for a closing statement. Uh, there are three questions that the League of Women Voters has posed that the candidates received prior to the forum. And then we are asking for questions from you in the audience. They should be questions that can be answered by uh, both candidates so that there is nothing that should be directed to one candidate only. Um, and we do have uh, people in the back of the room who have cards, so please write your questions and submit them so that uh, they can be asked of the candidates. And we will alternate with uh, the first, uh, one candidate giving an opening statement uh, and then the other candidate will speak first in terms of answering a question, and we'll keep alternating until we come to the end of the forum. In terms of, um, of your participation, we ask that you be respectful. Please turn off any of your electronic devices so there are no interruptions uh, during the forum. And also, please hold your applause or reactions <coughs> until the end of the forum so that we can keep things moving along. We do have timekeepers who will be indicating to the candidates when there is, I guess, 30 seconds left, and they will hold up a stop sign uh, at the end. And for the candidates, once they hold up the stop, I will ask you to stop speaking. Today- Please slow down. <laughs> okay, yeah. We do not have a red light camera here. Um, and um, it, it, today's uh, first uh, forum is the candidates for the 5th con Congressional District. Our first panel are the Democratic candidates. Again, this is a primary election that will take place on the 17th of March or during early voting. And you will have to declare whether you are voting Republican or Democrat. If you choose to take a Democratic ballot for the 5th Congressional District, the candidates are Brian Burns to my right and Mike Quigley to my left. And um, they will be your, they are your candidates for the Democratic nomination. So you would choose between them. At this point, we'll get started. Uh, we will uh, go alphabetically and Brian Burns will have one minute for an opening statement. All right. Uh, thank you, Gilda. I'd like to start by thanking the League for putting this event on. These are incredibly important things for our democracy. My name is Brian Burns, and I want to be your next congressperson. Uh, there are moments in history when everything hangs in the balance. Uh, the women's suffrage moment movement was such a moment for women. Uh, the civil rights era was such a moment for African Americans. And the 2015 Supreme Court ruling 
that uh, mandates equality of marriage for everybody was such a moment for the LGBTQ community. Uh, but right now we face a challenge that will affect the well-being of every man, woman, and child on the planet for generations to come. And just at the time when the threat of climate change demands a united effort across the world, demagoguery, authoritarianism, and nationalism are creeping into our global politics. We need a fundamental shift in our approach to government, and that's exactly my, why my campaign is proposing our Democracy 3.0 initiative which uh, is that we believe that the people in this audience are the best hope for overcoming these challenges. So please visit brianburns.com. Thank you. Mr. Quigley. Thank you. Extraordinary times indeed. I was in the room when President Obama said goodbye to the Democratic caucus and said, I envy you. You're in the arena to do this important fight. I was also in the room as a member of the House Select Committee on Intelligence when we first learned that the Russians attacked our democratic process. I've been honored to play an extraordinarily important role toward that end in the Russian investigation and the impeachment process. I'd like to come back and complete the job. There's an extraordinary amount at stake. At stake. I want to thank the uh, League for a different reason. Uh, I wouldn't be here without the League. I became the progressive member of the Cook County Board because the League of Women Voters uh, led the fight to have single-member districts. Without single-member districts, I don't get elected and don't have a chance to move forward to this spot. Thank you. Thank you. We will now uh, begin with the questions. Uh, and the, again, the first three questions are questions that the candidates received in advance that were uh, given by the League of Women Voters. And Mr. Quigley will answer the first question um, first. And the question is, where do you stand on the abolition of the Electoral College and why? I think the last election helps us understand that. Um, the fact of the matter is Hillary Clinton won the majority vote, the popular vote by far. Uh, unfortunately, we're still living under the, the dinosaur raid of uh, the Electoral College. It is going to be extremely difficult to change that, unfortunately. Yet it has to start from the ground up for a lot of reasons. I believe the Republicans will believe that it protects them, and numerically it probably does at this point. But remember, it takes two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, and three-quarters of the state. So our work's cut out for us. It has to be on a bipartisan basis, recognizing that to accomplish this, it has to happen in red states, too. Thank you. Mr. Burns, same question. Uh, I agree that we should abolish it. 65% of the American public uh, believe that whoever wins the popular vote should also win the presidency. Uh, and the supermajority is enough justification, but I think we should go further. See, our founders were mostly, were mostly wealthy elites. All of them were white. Uh, and most of them never intended that women, non-whites, or poor people would ever have a say in government. Thanks to the brave contributions of abolitionists, suffragists, and civil rights leaders, our government has evolved a lot since then. And at each step, this process has resulted in more people having more power over their government. And the result each time was predictable, better decisions for more people. This is one of the goals of Democracy 3.0. Our campaigns promise to use technology to give real political power back to the people. We believe that we can make better decisions when we leverage all of our collective wisdom. And if you'd like to help us build this future, please check out our website at brianburns.com and get involved with this uh, new way of looking at government. Thank you. The second question will be answered first by Brian Burns, and the question is, as a U.S. Congressman, how would you influence the treatment of immigrants facing political persecution or humanitarian crises? So first, I'd like to note that uh, Mr. Quigley has done some extraordinary work here, especially as it, results, uh, as it relates to trans people who are in ICE custody. So I'd like to thank the Congressman for that. Um, in 2019, Alexand Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was the sole Democrat uh, to vote against a spending bill because she did not want to continue funding ICE, uh, a government agency that has been responsible for 172 deaths of migrants in their detention centers since it was created in 2000 uh, after 9-11. Uh, um, so there's not a popular move by her. And setting aside the merits of this particular vote, I think that the courage displayed by AOC is desperately needed in Washington. As a congressman, I'll use my platform to advocate for the safe and welcoming treatment of immigrants, asylum seekers, and their families. I will vote my conscience and make principled stands where necessary to ensure that America is living up to its promise of being a shining beacon on the hill. The most important asset our country has is our ability to lead by example, and I intend to take the lead in making sure that we're doing just that. Thank you. 
Uh, Mike Quigley. I've been to the border twice and seen the inhumane conditions firsthand. Uh, this has to end. Uh, I think the first thing the administration needs to recognize is it has to, we have to deal with the humanitarian crisis at its base to address these issues and why people are forced to come to our borders seeking help. Uh, I've also fought as a chairman on the Appropriations Committee for reduced uh, cap capacity for detention beds, uh, an increase of alternative detentions, uh, obvious a need for a comprehensive immigration reform to move uh, forward on a, uh, a broader basis to address these issues. This isn't who we are as a country. It hurts us any number of ways, and it has to change. Thank you. The next question will be answered first by Mike Quigley, and the question is, the Clean Power Plan announced in August 2015 set the first ever limits on carbon pollution from U.S. power plants. What is your stance on the repeal of the Clean Power Plan by the White House? I think the only way to describe this is that on, on this and many other issues, there almost seems to be a vindictive personal matter that this president has with anything that took place in the Obama administration, never mind the fact that he leads the deniers about climate change, uh, which is extraordinary. And unfortunately, I serve with uh, a whole lot of other Republicans that feel the same way. But uh, I was in uh, the Rocky Mountains on a climate change tour talking about how important it is to the headwaters of the Colorado River when it was announced that we pulled out of the Paris Accord. So it's not just the Clean Power Plan, which was so important, and the aspect to that, and I fully supported it then and do now. It was being part of a worldwide uh, community that leads that fight, coordinating it with so many others because we simply can't do it in one country as a whole. But I'm glad to fight this fight every day. Thank you. Brian Burns. The repeal of the Clean Power Plan was a major setback in our fight uh, against the rising CO2 levels that are fueling the climate emergency. Uh, we should learn at least two things from this. First, uh, that po uh, policy undertaken by the stroke of an executive order alone is never sufficient because it can easily be undone. And second, that Republican leaders are unswayed by science and will exercise all the power they have in order to pursue the agenda of their donor base. Uh, while the costs of climate change are difficult to estimate, in 2017 alone, the United States spent $250 billion cleaning up after hurricanes Harvey, Maria, and Irma. Uh, the second important takeaway is that the Republican leadership uh, is, is out of step with a lot of the Republican base. 62% uh, of Republicans say the United States should be prioritizing alternative energy over expanding fossil fuels, and 52% of young Republicans think that the government is doing too little on climate. We need to build a coalition that includes Republicans so that we can fight uh, the climate emergency together. Thank you. Um, we are still waiting for some questions from the audience, but as we're waiting, I'll ask uh, the following question, and it will be answered first by Brian Burns, and the question is, what do you feel is the most important issue uh, that you will have to deal with if you are elected? I think that the most important issue that our country is facing is a lack of engagement uh, with the entire population. Uh, we have more people voting uh, recently, likely due to the Trump presidency, uh, but I don't think that voting every two years is enough. I think that we thrive as a country when we have more people involved in the decision-making process, and that's one thing that my campaign is trying to do with our Democracy 3.0 initiative. Uh, the goal is to continuously be gathering feedback from constituents and incorporating that into policy in real time, so that instead of just voting every two years and then hoping that your representative does what you like, uh, you can be in a constant engagement with your representative. Uh, we have tools and technologies now that our founding fathers could never have dreamed of, uh, and I believe that it's time that we put those to use to build a more responsive government for the 21st century. Thank you. Mike Quigley. President Obama said that this is the first generation to feel the effects of climate change, and the last generation that can do anything about it. Ironically, it actually works in opposite ways in which we just heard. The fact of the matter is, because members seem to be focused on the next election, the fact that it's almost always here because we serve in two-year terms, longer-term issues seem less important to them for whatever reasons. So uh, to me, it's getting the public to recognize and pressure for immediate actions of the lawmakers 
who see climate change as something, for whatever reasons, that isn't something they have to worry about today and right now. The urgency is there for our economy, for our health, for our national security, um, and for our generations to come. Thank you. Uh, the next question uh, will be answered first by Mike Quigley, and the question is, assuming Trump is not removed from office, it seems inevitable that there will be a lot of political chaos in the aftermath of the presidential election. What measures can be taken to ensure the integrity of the election and acceptance of the results in such a bitterly divided political climate? Tomorrow I'm holding a press conference with Governor Pritzker announcing the fact that uh, I had passed a measure on appropriations to provide $420 million more for election security, uh, of which Illinois will receive a significant amount. We can't inoculate ourselves to a degree to what the Russians did and what others might. Uh, we can buy new election equipment, we can buy protect against cyber attacks. Um, but more importantly, and has addressed this president as well, you have to ask yourself, why was it so easy when the Russians weaponized social media for them to turn us against each other? If, as you suggest, and that alternative were to take place, in the final analysis, we have to remind ourselves that there's more that unites us than divides us. And we need to come out of this dark tunnel at some point, working together toward a common interest. Thank you. Brian Burns. So I, I agree with Mr. Quigley on all of the things that need to be done with regards to our election security. At the same time, I don't think that even if we have very secure elections, that that alone will be enough to ensure a smooth transition of power. I believe that if Trump is in a close election, I think that there is a very strong likelihood that he will contest it, that he will deny the results, uh, or that he will, you know, try to start a disruption via his Twitter account. So. What I think we need to do to make sure that that doesn't happen is I think that Democrats need to come out and we need to win big. Uh, we need somebody at the top of the ticket that energizes our base. We need more turnout than we've ever had in the history of our party. And we need to make sure that everybody knows that this is, uh, this is a referendum on Trump. This is a referendum on uh, the way that he's been consolidating power. And in the, at the end of the day, it's a referendum on democracy itself. So we need high turnout and we need to win big. Thank you. Uh, the next question goes first to Brian Burns, and the question is, what can you as a representative for the 5th fifth, fifth Congressional District do to encourage more affordable housing in the 5th Congressional District? So one of the things that I'm uh, a big believer in is transit-centered development, uh, which is essentially where you make it easier for developers to build housing in, uh, in and around uh, areas of public transit. Um, in Chicago, rents are getting higher and higher. Um, and the, one of the ways that you relax that is by making it easier to build more housing stock. So I think that we need to recognize that cities are not only an economic engine for the country, uh, not only are they one of the greenest ways that you can live in a 21st century economy, uh, but neither of those things mean anything if people can't afford to live there. So we need more housing stock to make sure that uh, rent prices come down. Uh, and by doing that, we can ensure that, uh, that life is affordable and that people have room to grow. Thank you. Mike Quigley? This week I visited with the residents of Greencastle right here in Elmhurst and uh, uh, talking to those constituents, uh, I, I heard the same thing and the concerns they have. Fortunately, I'm able to act on this. I'm a chairman on one subcommittee. I'm the second ranking to the chairman on transportation, housing, urban development. And we have started to, when, since we got the majority back uh, a year ago, start diverting more direct aid to providing low-income housing, assistant housing, particularly senior citizens uh, throughout the 5th District. Uh, I do believe we're going to pass an infrastructure bill in, out of the House in the coming year, and I do believe and I know it will involve a great deal of affordable housing for those in need across the country. Thank you. The next question goes first to Mike Quigley, and the question is, have you or will you endorse a candidate for president? I have, I have not endorsed a candidate for president. Uh, last three months I've, I've been a little busy. Um, and frankly, I wanted to see how some of this uh, shook out. I will tell you this, uh, I am going to endorse someone 
uh, it's going to be, in my mind, the person who has the absolute best chance of winning. I understand the significant differences in the candidates and the primaries on important issues. I get that. But in the final analysis, pick an issue that you care about. The viability of that candidate is going to ha mean a lot more than the nuances and differences that may exist between the Democrats, because there are nuances and differences between Democrats, and it's the Grand Canyon between those candidates and the current occupant of the White House. Thank you. Brian Burns. Uh, I have not endorsed a candidate yet. Uh, I do anticipate doing so probably within uh, the next two weeks. Uh, I think that whatever candidate we choose, again, going back to my previous answer, needs to be somebody that excites our base. Uh, I think that the two candidates most likely to do that right now are Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Uh, I think that we need truly progressive ideas right now in order to swing the pendulum back toward uh, a future where um, we can kind of start cleaning up a lot of the mess that has been caused by this Trump White House. So uh, I have not done so yet. I anticipate doing so soon. Thank you. Next question goes first to Brian Burns, and the question is, what are your thoughts on gerrymandering, and what changes, and if uh, you think changes are needed, uh, what should be done? I think that gerrymandering is one of the root causes of all of the gridlock that we're having right now in Washington. Uh, combined with campaign finances, uh, it ensures that uh, the public is polarized, and it makes it very, very difficult for new people and new ideas to get in there. Um, my belief is that we should and must uh, change our election laws so that uh, districts are drawn by computers. We have. Uh, the technology to very easily and very simply draw boundaries that are squares. Uh, if anybody has seen a map of the 5th District, it looks like a giant lobster or a crustacean of some sort. Um, and to me, it, it's fundamentally embarrassing uh, to look at that. And you know, people will ask me, oh, am I in your district? Am I not in your district? And it's really hard to know. It's, it, well, it depends. If you, if you go straight on that block and you don't go left, uh, you are. If you go right, if you curve around the alley or not. Um, so I think that gerrymandering is inherently a corrupt process, and I think that we need to get rid of it and just take politics out of it entirely. Thank you. Mike Quigley. The uh, recent Supreme Court case makes this extraordinarily difficult to do, but we're going to have to try. But basically what the Supreme Court said was, eh, oh, state, you can do what you want. It's not a federal issue for us to have to decide. Uh, they just couldn't be more wrong. The fact of the matter is I served five terms in which more people voted for a Democrat for Congress than a Republican. Yet in those five terms, we were in the minority. So it's clear. But it has to be done, in my mind, on a national basis. It has to be driven that way. Otherwise, it's, it's a unilateral surrender. And the Republicans have shown absolutely no willingness to reach any sort of accord toward that end. So again, this has to come from the ground up, has to be organic, it has to be national, and it has to involve driving judges, justices, who are going to support such measures as well. Thank you. First question, uh, the next question will be answered first by Mike Quigley. And the questioner is asking, why is it hearsay is considered better than evidence? Uh, I practiced criminal law for 10 years full time, uh, 18 altogether. Uh, this references the fact that in uh, this uh, process, I was, uh, I was told the evidence against the president was weak because it's all hearsay. I, first thing I said was, if you don't like the evidence, allow these people to testify and release the documents. Second of all, if you think it's all hearsay, there are 23 exceptions to the hearsay rule under the federal rules of evidence. Once it's evidence. Once it's deemed admissible, evidence is evidence, and it's up to the trier of fact. But it's an extraordinary example of how we're talking past each other and not worried about what the law is and what the facts are. I was speaking truth to power so the American people might get a chance to hear what the witnesses would say about the president's actions. Thank you. Brian Burns. Uh, yeah, so in law school, you have uh, probably a month of your evidence class, at least, is on hearsay exceptions and why some are good and why some are bad. Uh, I'll agree with everything 
that Mike's, or sorry, that Mr. Quigley has said that it, it's complicated. Um, and just to kind of add to that, I think that his comments uh, were taken out of context. Uh, this is, again, a result of the cable news media chopping everything down into four to five second sound bites. Um, and, you know, if just the one sentence that you said that gets repeated over and over sounds a little bit silly on its own. Uh, but again, I, I don't think that that's a reason to, um, I, I don't think that that's how we should be judging our politicians. I think that we need to elevate the discourse and really try to understand where people are coming from. And you just simply cannot do that in these short uh, 15 second sound bites. So uh, if anybody wants to talk rules uh, about hearsay or, or hearsay exceptions, uh, we can do that. It's just going to take a lot longer than the five seconds that uh, Mr. Quigley had. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the uh, final question is, um, will be answered first by Brian Burns, and it, it's, do you see any transportation needs in the 5th uh, Congressional District that need uh, to be addressed federally? Yeah, I think that, uh, well, you can just look outside of my, my apartment, and there's been, um, there's been construction on a, a water main out there for, for the past, uh, feels like a year, probably about six months. Uh, federal dollars are, are crucial to helping cities to upgrade their infrastructure. Um, I got a very scary notice put on my door about uh, lead, lead poisoning as a result of what the work that they did on the water mains. I think that this is an issue that we need federal dollars to investigate to make sure that there is not lead in the very old uh, uh, water pipes that we have. Uh, and then on uh, the transportation and, and just roads, uh, you know, anybody who's driven around Chicago knows that there's potholes that can swallow a car. Uh, and so there, there's a lot of room for federal dollars there, and I think that uh, that's one of the, the areas that's just a basic function of government. Um, you can't rely on businesses to build roads. You can't rely on, on citizens to do it. Uh, so that's a perfect example of where the federal government should step in and, and help cities especially uh, t to build out their infrastructure. Thank you. Mike Quigley? Um, it is my hope to become the chairman of the committee that writes the transportation funding bill for the country. It is not enough, though, to have that power and influence. It's putting it in the right direction. I remember where the Republican chairman in charge of the committee, that subcommittee, a few years ago said, we don't have a lot of money, so we're only going to spend it on the, the critical things, roads and bridges. The fact of the matter is you know how important Metro is to all of you. You know how important PACE is. You know how important... Uh, the blue line is. And we can't think as a country in such a parochial sense that we're only worried about ourselves. We're several trillion behind our economic competitors across the world. We have to work with each other across the country. I should be just as concerned with the infrastructure and the locks in the Mississippi as they are with the red line being extended and rebuilt. If we can accomplish that, we can not only drive our economy forward, we can do so in a sustainable manner. Thank you. We'll now be moving on to the closing statements, but before we do so, and as the candidates are gathering their thoughts, I'd like to uh, remind you that you can review information about these candidates and all candidates on your ballot by going to IllinoisVoterGuide.org. So uh, re remember that. And that will be live by February 6th and all of your candid candidates on the ballot will be listed there. And remember, too, that the primary election is on March 17th, with early voting before that. And now we will have the closing statements. And the first closing statement will be from Mike Quigley. Sometimes it's easy to forget when we talk about the federal issues that uh, two of the last three governors are in jail or went to jail. Two of the last three people who sat in my seat uh, went to jail or are in jail. It's a trick point because one of them is the same person. But the fact of the matter is it's extremely important and the federal government can play a role. When I got there, I formed the Transparency Caucus. It was an extension of the work we tried to do at Cook County Board to provide greater transparency and accountability. And we're going to be passing measures very soon on this, and we're also driving issues like cameras in the Supreme Court. I fund the Supreme Court out of our committee, and I ask the justices, how come they can watch Congress and not watch you? You all decided who won a presidential election. That's pretty important. It may not be beautiful all the time. The, camera, the trains don't always run all the time in a democracy, but we need to be able to watch to help regain some of that trust so people know how those decisions are being made. Thank you. And Brian Burns. 
So at the end of the day, Mr. Quigley and I are fighting the same fight. We both want a sustainable environment, universal health care, and an economy that works for everyone. The biggest difference between us is how we go about achieving those. Now, the standard Washington formula is that we get to vote every two years, and then we spend the rest of the time powerless. I'm running because I believe that we make better decisions when we combine our collective wisdom. Democracy 3.0 is about finding ways to harness that wisdom. That means that if you vote for me, I will continuously be checking in with you and taking direction from you on how we should move our country forward. And even if you don't vote for me, and even if you're a Republican, I will still ask for and try to act upon your advice. The definition of insanity is trying the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results. So if you're tired of the gridlock in Washington, this is your chance to do something about it. Visit brianburns.com because we need your input. And remember that on March 17th, you have a real choice. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our Democratic candidates, uh, Brian Burns and Mike Quigley. Thank you for your uh, answers and your thoughtful responses to the questions. And again, please remember to vote. And let's give our candidates a big hand. Your time. Thank you and welcome. My name is Gilda Carew. I will be your moderator this afternoon. Uh, I am with the League of Women Voters of the Arlington Heights, Mount Prospect, Buffalo Grove area. So I do not live in this district and I will not be voting in this district. And I am a neutral party. Uh, this forum is with the Republican candidates for the nomination to run at, for Congress in the 5th Congressional District. We have Tommy Hansen and Kimball Ladian, who, um, <clears throat> who are running as Republicans. So as a reminder, when you vote in a primary election, you have to declare whether you are voting as a Republican or a Democrat. So if you take a Republican ballot, you will have a choice between Tommy Hansen and Kimball Ladian. The way our forum will work this afternoon, uh, first of all, I'd ask all of you to please uh, put your devices on, um, on mute or uh, turn them off uh, so that there are no interruptions during the forum. And I'd also ask you to refrain from any kind of outbursts or applause or anything um, during the forum and wait uh, until the uh, forum is over. Uh, the way it will work, both candidates will have one minute for an opening statement. Each candidate will have up to a minute to answer each question that is asked, and each candidate will have one minute for a closing statement. Uh, we will alternate between the candidates so that the same candidate is not always answering first or second. We will, uh, we will reverse the order as we go, al as we go along. With that, uh, I'd like to uh, get started with our opening statements, uh, which will be done alphabetically. And the first opening statement is from Tommy Hansen. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I've met a few people and I've really enjoyed the visit. Of course I wanna be the Congressman, but if you're gonna remember me today, what I really wanna be known for is I'd like Governor Rod Blagojevich to be pardoned. I don't think he really did anything wrong. I think he knew too much. And I think that he served enough time that he needs to come home. And I think that if he comes home, he could be the key to unlocking a lot of the problems we have in Illinois. The corruption, the high taxes, the mismanagement of our government. And I hope that you will remember today that I'm the one that wants Rod Blagojevich to be pardoned. Thank you. Kim Ladian. Yes, um, good afternoon to everybody. Um, uh, I am both a physician and a scientist, and my reason for running is to move from politics as usual to good government based on good science and outcomes as opposed to simply more um, ideology, one side or the other, to basically to end gridlock. As a, science, as a physician, I have a safe haven program I've worked on for over 30 years with bipartisan support. It's like the old CCC or WPA and uh, can 
provide jobs and uh, it saves not only lives but enough money to pay off the pensions without having to raise taxes. I'll say that again, without having to raise taxes. And uh, as a scientist, I have something called the Global Energy Independence Program that provides clean, renewable energy that can save two to three trillion with AT annually. All of this is on my website, um, ladyinforcongress.com. You can read it. Uh, bottom line is ending gridlock. My Thank wife you. was murdered uh, eight years ago now. Um, it's a matter of double standards. Uh, I'd like to discuss it more, but if you Thank go you. to ladyin.com, you'll see it. Thank you. Uh, and uh, just as a reminder, we do have uh, timekeepers here who will be indicating if when you have 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and stop. And I will ask you to please stop once they hold up the stop sign. Uh, the second, uh, the first question will be answered first by Kim Ladian. And these were the first three questions are from the League of Women Voters and were given to the candidates in advance. And the question is, where do you stand on the abolition of the Electoral College and why? Well, from the inception of the country, there were large states and small states, and the Electoral College, like the bicameral government itself, were compromises between big states and small states, so that the small states weren't always dominated by, by larger uh, um, uh, uh, states, which is still the issue today. Um, I uh, am going to expand it a little uh, bit. Uh, values between small states and large states are often quite different. Um, cities have a lot of crime, and uh, rural areas maybe not so much. Um, I raised the issue of impeachment as one of the questions, and it didn't get raised. That's sort of a matter of double standards that I'd like to come back to, because there's probably nothing more important in terms of gridlock than ending, um, ending the impeachment issues. Thank you. Tommy Hansen. I believe that the Constitution was written for a reason, to keep our country together. I don't believe the Constitution is a living document that can be changed. I'm against the Electoral College being abolished. I think it's a way of balancing out the vote for everybody throughout the country. Yes, the big cities, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, have more people, and there can be a larger popular vote, whereas an electoral vote may be less for somebody that has a larger uh, popular vote. But imagine going to the grocery store, and there's nothing there, no food, no greens, no fruit, no nothing. These all come from the farmers of our country, the rural areas that want to be represented. I believe that the electoral college should stay in place. Thank you. The uh, next question will be answered first by Tommy Hansen. The question is, as a U.S. Congressman, how would you influence the treatment of immigrants facing political persecution or humanitarian crises? I, I'm not for illegal immigration. I'm not for having these uh, no walls or no boundaries. I think that the people that are coming here illegally should stay at home and band together and fight for their own cause at home. What's happening instead are the people, the, the countries that they're leaving are, are grateful that they're leaving and they're coming to the U.S. instead. It, it's like this. Imagine if you just unlock your doors tonight and just let anybody in. It's the same thing as letting them into the country. If you're going to unlock your doors and let people sit in your uh, uh, den and watch TV and use your refrigerator and all that stuff, it's the same thing as letting them into the country. They're overloading our system. We have to take care of our own people. We don't have the money to take care of everybody in this world. Thank you. Kim Ladian? Well, I'm absolutely for legal immigration and strongly against illegal immigration, and there's a fundamental distinction between the two. Most of us, all of us, are immigrants at one point or another, so it's not a matter of immigration, it's how you do it, and no country can survive without laws. Uh, I mentioned as a physician, I have a safe haven program that can provide jobs 
um, for all adults. And um, just like with penicillin, what can be done in uh, Illinois and Chicago can be done across the country and can be done in other countries as well. So we could have sanctuary cities and states in countries around the world where they have jobs and safety just like we should have here. That's what good science does, and two to three trillion dollars a year can help make that happen. Thank you. The uh, third question will be answered first by Kim Ladian. The question is, the Clean Power Plan announced in August 2015 set the first ever limits on carbon pollution from U.S. power plants. What is your stance on the repeal of the Clean Power Plan by the White House? So again, I mentioned as a scientist, I have a very simple equation uh, that provides clean, renewable energy and globally can save two to three trillion. So to answer your question, uh, we can be far ahead of the bureaucrats in terms of solving these problems with good science, getting away from gridlock and having programs that actually work. An engineer who worked with uh, um, Jack Welch at General Electric is signed a letter saying that the equation does exactly what I say. We can use it uh, to have clean, renewable energy across the country and across the world. Thank you. Tommy Hansen. I think we have far more pressing problems than the Clean Power Act or plan. Uh, our country has a huge deficit. And here at home in Illinois, we're losing hundreds of thousands of people leaving. Our taxes are going up. Uh, businesses are closing down. And Illinois has gone from the fifth largest state to the sixth largest state. Chicago has gone from the 15th largest world economy to the 21st largest world economy. And that's going to become a national issue if Illinois starts getting in a worse situation. So I think we have far more pressing issues. Uh, the crime downtown in Chicago is getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, they come downtown on the subways and they have flash games and they beat up people and they rob people and they're going to come out here eventually on the trains and they're going to do that to you too. So I think we have a far more greater problems than the clean power plan. Thank you. The next question will be answered first by Tommy Hansen. The question is, assuming Trump is not removed from office, it seems inevitable that there will be a list, a lot of political chaos in the aftermath of the presidential election. What measures can be taken to ensure the integrity of the election and acceptance of the results in such a bitterly divided political climate? Well, I think you're making a big assumption that there's going to be political chaos. I think everybody knows where they stand. You're either for or against. But what we really need to do is just educate ourselves. And that's what you're doing today. You're here today for a reason. You want to learn about what I have to say or my other Republican candidate here has to say or, or Mr. Quigley or, or Mr. Burns. So the more education people have, the less they should be fighting each other. It's better to just make an educated uh, decision than to have your feelings control how you vote. Thank you. Kim Ladian. So anybody in America with an IQ above room temperature would know that uh, Hunter Biden, who doesn't speak Ukrainian, knows nothing about oil or gas and has paid millions by Burisma simply because his father happens to be vice president, uh, is both unethical and corrupt. Um, uh, Trump had every, not only the right, but the responsibility to investigate corruption, but we need to get beyond gridlock. We do that. I have a, uh, uh, ladyinforcongress.com, I have a bipartisan contract for America that um, implements safe haven, which can reduce gang crime and murders around the country, saves billions. My global energy independence program uh, pays, saves more than enough money in uh, the United States to pay for universal health care and education. Um, so we can do things on a bipartisan basis at leading.com and explains how. Thank you. Uh, the next question goes first to Kim Ladian. The question is, what are your thoughts on gerrymandering, and are changes needed, and if so, what? Well, um, 
Mike Quigley mentioned that the uh, Supreme Court recently um, uh, ruled on the subject in terms of it was pretty much a state's uh, rights issue that um, states could do it as they want. I think it makes sense to have uh, 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 gerrymandering reduced uh, for any number of reasons. It helps to increase competition among uh, the, uh, the sides and actually encourages bipartisanism. So I would encourage uh, uh, reductions in gerrymandering, but that's the state's uh, issue. Thank you. Tommy Hansen. Gerrymandering doesn't really bother me. Uh, the 5th District is 70% Democrat. It's 30% Republican. And I think uh, as long as I can get a voice or my partner here over here can get a voice, then people may be heard like us. And that's why you're here today. So it really doesn't bother me. I don't see how you can make circles or squares and put them on a map and do it like that. So I'm, I'm fine with it. I think eventually, uh, as far as we are here in Illinois, the problems are getting so great that people like me are getting heard. So it doesn't bother me at all. Thank you. Next question goes first to Tommy Hansen. The question is, if you were a current member of Congress, what would your position regarding evidence being heard and presented at the uh, current impeachment trial be? Well, it's like this. Uh, the, the, this whole impeachment thing is about obstruction or, or bribery. And the bribery is all based upon hearsay. There were no witnesses that directly testified that the president did anything wrong. And the impeachment is primarily based on hearsay. So any one of you could be taken to court by somebody that heard something about you. And, and imagine, uh, in the instance of Mr. Quigley saying that hearsay is better than evidence, imagine if somebody said you or you or you did something, they heard about it, and they took it to the judge. And imagine if that judge was Congressman Michael Quigley, where he says, well, okay, that sounds pretty good, even though it's not direct evidence. Think on how that would make you feel. I, I think that evidence is far more important, especially in a law of court, a court of law. Thank you. Kim Ladian. Okay, so I mentioned Hunter Biden's actions being thoroughly unethical, not to mention uh, uh, criminal, and that Trump had every right in the world, in fact, responsibility to investigate corruption, um, just like they did with Russian collusion. Um, Biden could be blackmailed about that as, just as easily. So that's a story far from over. I uh, also mentioned my wife being murdered. Uh, she was had an IQ of 185 and was a mystery writer and was investigating Obama and the murder of Don Young. Don Young was the gay choir director of Reverend Wright's church, and he was murdered execution style just before the, uh, uh, well, December 23rd of 2007. What the police found out very quickly was that Obama had been his lover. This is Don Young's mother, and uh, she has said that uh, he was the lover and that she has standing to ask for a um, uh, special prosecutor. It's the double standards. The faster we get away from double standards, the better. Thank you. Uh, the next question goes first to Kim Ladian, and the question is, have you or will you endorse a candidate for president? How do I? Will you endorse a candidate for president, or have you? <laughs> That's easy. Uh, I think uh, Donald Trump, uh, uh, here's a thought for you all. Uh, appeasement never works. You can ask Winston Churchill, you can ask Joe Stalin. Appeasement never works. Neither North Korea nor Iran need to develop a single ICBM. Uh, they have enough nuclear fissile material uh, to have suitcase nukes all around the country all around the world already. Um, appeasement doesn't work, and Trump is the one person that could stop that. And uh, um, uh, to the extent that two to three trillion dollars can help to have a peace paradigm um, that uh, helps Russia and China help us in that, so much the better. Thank you. Tommy Hansen. Well, I'm obviously for Donald Trump, and I think one of the greatest accomplishments that the president has made is he makes the guy on the bus think that didn't care before. He's making everybody think. 
He's helping people understand what the Constitution is about. I don't think anybody understood what the FBI or the CIA or the NSA or any of these uh, departments were about until M Donald Trump came along. And everybody's talking about the president. Everything the president does, everybody in the world's talking about. And the more people listen to him, the more they're educated. They're more educated about our country, our Constitution, why we're here. He's making people think. And that's how you get people to vote. When they become educated and they understand, they become motivated, and then they, and then they vote. And that's why we'll have a huge turnout in the next election, because everybody is really thinking about what to do, whereas before they didn't care. Thank you. The uh, next question will be answered first by Tommy Hansen. Uh, the question is, what, is the mo what do you see as the most important issue in the 5th Congressional District? Well, boy, that's a, that's a hard one to answer in one minute, but I, I actually think that Illinois is going broke, and there are too many people leaving, and the crime is out of control because there are people that can't make money, and they're not making enough money, so they rob people or they sell drugs, and they get in trouble. And I really think that we're in trouble in Illinois. And like I said before, Illinois used to be the fifth largest state, and now it's the sixth largest state in the country. And that doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't mean that anybody's doing better than us. Illinois is a great state, but we're losing a lot of people. And the 5th District is seeing a lot of unhappy people walking around mad and upset because business is not that great. So I think that that's the problem. We've got to do something about Illinois. We've got to stop the corruption. We've got to stop all the mismanagement of our money. And that's going to become a national issue if Illinois becomes a Detroit. Thank you. Kim Ladian. Well, um, there are many, many issues, but I'm going to put ending gridlock at the top because to the extent that we look at problems not as politics as usual, but in terms of good science and good preventive medicine um, and outcomes-based research, um, we can do profound good for the country. We can reduce gang crime and murders 95% uh, uh, in the next few years uh, with safe haven type programs. We can um, pre, um, pay for universal health care and education on a bipartisan basis. Uh, uh, two to three trillion a year uh, globally is a trillion a year in the United States, and that can do a lot to th do things bipartisan basis and, and gridlock in the process. Thank you. The next question will be answered first by Kim Ladian, and the question is, what are your thoughts on uh, the right to life versus a woman's right to choose? Mm. I uh, mentioned, uh, well, both my mother, Julia, and my uh, wife, Sylvia, uh, had IQs of 185, and they were as brilliant as they were kind-hearted, um, but all of my life I've been a heroin addict with an E, so I, <laughs> I couldn't be more strongly in favor of women and women's rights on any number of levels. But I feel also profoundly that it, uh, abortion is a profoundly individual question, and it is a state's right issue, um, should be decided by individual states. But the more we have a dialogue and a respect for life, a respect for life at every level, from the newborn to the unborn to the elderly, um, the better a society will have. So. Um, let's hope we can find a dialogue on it. Thank you. Tommy Hansen. I'm pro-life, and I'm not for abortion. And I don't care if I don't win the election, because that's my position. I believe at conception, that's a life. That's where two people come together and the DNA becomes a person. I saw this morning on TV a lady who had been aborted uh, after three months, her uh, mother aborted her, and she was accidentally born. And this woman uh, is actually an incredible person. And there are a lot of people that were supposed to be aborted and killed, but they lived. And they're grateful that they're alive. And I don't believe in abortion, and I'm never going to change my position on that. Thank you. Final question before we go to the closing statements is, do you see any transportation needs in the 5th Congressional District that need to be addressed federally? And will be answered first by Tommy Hansen. 
Uh, you know, it's amazing that transportation in Chicago is one of the best in the country. It's second to New York. Uh, you may have a city like Nashville that's booming and booming and booming, and they're growing and growing and growing, but they don't have the transportation that we have. The subway system, the buses, everything is being modernized. But the main issue is crime. And I think that the federal government can work with us, with the Chicago police and the communities, on how to fight the crime. Because a lot of people are getting beat up on the subways downtown. Uh, they ride from uh, the crime-infested areas. They come downtown, and there are flash mobs. And, and crime is a bad thing downtown. A lot of people are getting beat up and hurt. And eventually, they're going to get on the trains, like I said before, and come out here uh, because People aren't making money, and they need to make money, and crime is a big issue, and I'm sure the federal government and the president will be happy to help here with that. Thank you. Kim Ladian. So Tommy Hansen is absolutely right about crime and needing to prevent it on all, <laughs> all areas, but certainly in, on um, the transportation as well. Countries from Britain to China have shown how to use cameras of uh, technology to uh, significantly reduce crime. Remember science? So this is science. So uh, as a scientist, uh, there's a technology the Dutch developed for dredging uh, and making making islands, uh, now the, the Koreans are using it, et cetera. But we could actually dredge uh, a area uh, from Lake Michigan to bypass downtown and, uh, and have much better transportation, uh, and uh, the system could potentially even pay for itself and avoid erosion in the process. So good science versus politics, as usual. Thank you. And now we'll be moving on to our closing statements. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to remind you again that information about these candidates and all of your candidates that will be on the ballot uh, can be found at IllinoisVoterGuide.org, and that will be live by February 6th. So again, all of the candidates will be listed, and it will be a good source for you before you go to the polls to uh, get information. Again. The uh, primary election is on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. So, uh, uh, but there will be early voting before that. So uh, uh, please uh, do go out and vote. And again, if you vote for, want to vote for either of these candidates, you will have to take a Republican ballot. And now we'll move to the closing statements. The first closing statement will be from Kim Ladian. Okay, so again, as a physician as well as a scientist, uh, we need to have a paradigm shift from politics as usual to good, good government based on good science. We can do that and we can end gridlock on a bipartisan basis. If you go to ladyinforcongress.com, you can read all the details. I mentioned my wife being murdered. This, so this is very personal uh, to me. She was investigating Obama and the murder of Don Young. Don Young's mother says that, uh, that uh, this all happened and she has standing for a special prosecutor. We can get past gridlock. By the way, this is Obama's uh, mother, for what it's worth. She was working for the CIA. If you're interested, go to lady.com and you can find out all, all about it. End gridlock, and you do that by good science, replacing politics as usual. Thank you. Tommy Hansen? Uh, I'm 65 years old. I'm. Uh, a capitalist. I'm a commercial real estate broker. I've been doing it for 32 years. I work for CEOs, presidents, owners of companies, and I help them buy and lease commercial real estate. It's a very difficult business. Uh, I do very well, and that's kind of how I look at things. I also believe that um, you, can, you can be healed financially, physically, emotionally, mentally, uh, if you just think about things the right way. And I think um, in the Bible it says, love thy neighbor. I think we should do more of that. Respect your parents. And um, God bless the country. We need to get together. We need to solve our problems together. I hope we don't have division. I hope we just think fairly about what we're doing as individuals and how we should get Thank together. You. Thank you. And at this point, I'd like to thank both of our Republican candidates, Tommy Hansen and Kim Ladian, for their uh, participation in this afternoon's forum and for their uh, answers to the uh, questions. And let's give them a big hand.
I count, you, you count, count, everyone, everyone counts. counts Elmhurst. Elmhurst. The city of Elmhurst is home to over 45,000 residents. But the U.S. Constitution mandates that everyone in the country be counted every 10 years. The United States counts everyone living in the country on April 1st, regardless of their nationality or living situation. Completing the census is mandatory. It's a way to participate in our democracy and say, I count. Taking part is your civic duty. The census is about fair representation at the federal level. Every 10 years, the results of the census are used to determine how many seats each state gets in the House of Representatives. After each decade's census, congressional, state, and local legislative district boundaries are redrawn to account for population shifts, including Elmhurst ward boundaries. The census is a snapshot in time. It aims to count the entire population of our country and the location each person usually lives. The census asks questions of people in homes and group living situations, including how many people live or stay in each home as well as the sex, age, and race of each person. The goal is to count everyone, once, only once, and in the right place. When you respond to the census, you help Elmhurst get its fair share of the more than $675 billion per year in federal funds spent on schools, hospitals, roads, public works, and other vital programs. Federal funds, grants, and support to states, counties, and communities are based on population totals and breakdowns by sex, age, race, and other factors. The community benefits most when the census counts everyone. The census is a valuable tool for improving communities across the country. Funds distributed from the census equate to approximately $6 million annually for the city of Elmhurst. That allocation provides funding for local projects such as road resurfacing and supports community initiatives from public safety preparedness to quality of life and economic development growth. If members of the community don't respond to the census, Elmhurst may not receive the funding it deserves. Your census responses are safe and secure. The Census Bureau is required by law to protect any personal information collected and keep it strictly confidential. Your answers may only be used to produce statistics. They cannot be used for law enforcement purposes or to determine your personal eligibility for government benefits. To be clear, there will not be a citizenship question and respondents will not be required to submit their social security number. 2020 will introduce the first modern census, the first to be available online. The days of the old-fashioned, long-form census are over. Because getting an accurate count is so important, the process is designed to be fast and easy. On average, it takes no more than 10 minutes to answer the questions on the census. Beginning in March 2020, when it's time to respond, households will receive an invitation in the mail from the U.S. Census Bureau. Every household will have the option of responding online, by mail, or by phone. Households that don't respond in one of these ways will be visited by a census taker to collect the information in person. In the 2010 census, only 86% of Elmhurst households responded. You can help create a better future for Elmhurst by responding to the 2020 census. Providing an up-to-date and accurate count of our population is critical. With an accurate snapshot of the Elmhurst community, the Park District is able to plan, budget, and develop new parks and programs that will be beneficial to the Elmhurst community. An estimated 5% of children under the age of 5 weren't counted in the 2010 census. Census results help us understand how demographics, including income, education levels, and population size, are changing in Elmhurst. Having an accurate picture of all residents, including children 5 and younger, allows District 205 to engage in long-term planning to meet the needs of current and future students. The Elmhurst Public Library, Elmhurst School District 205, the Elmhurst Park District, and City of Elmhurst are committed partners in making sure all of Elmhurst is counted accurately in the 2020 census. Each week leading up to the census deadline, you can learn more about your fellow Elmhurst residents who are likewise committed to being counted in 2020. Join us in being counted. Remember the census counts all people living or staying at an address, not just the person or family who owns or rents the property. So be sure to include your entire household. To learn more about the U.S. Census, local programming, and where to find assistance in responding to Census 2020, please visit the city's website, elmhurst.org census 2020.